so can we start the meeting yes we can start uh, can you see my slide okay so once mm -hmm. rishmi hello hello adam am i audible yeah, yeah i can hear you yes okay okay so today's uh, lecture is about power consumption in integrated circuits uh, during this talk session we'll be going through historical evolution of semiconductors uh, technology and integrated circuits understand how power consumption became a critical design optimization parameter and learn about various challenges involved in design for low power our speaker for today is manal dev gomani he is a researcher at nokia bell technology in belgium and a guest lecturer at the electronic systems group in eton university of technology the netherlands his, his research areas are confined to to the different aspects of integrated circuits such as application specific processes memory subsystems system on chip architecture on chip interconnect and design automation he received his phd in electrical engineering from eton university of technology in 2015 masters in electrical engineering from Linköping University, Sweden in 2010 and a Bachelor of Technology in Applied Electronics from College of Engineering, Trivandrum in 2002. A warm welcome to you, sir, and a warm welcome to everyone here. Over thank to you, you, sir. Yeah, thank you for the introduction. Um, so uh, before I start, uh, can you confirm if you can see my slide uh, about the first slide or not yet? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's actually visible. So okay, so. now I just move the slide. Okay, you can see the slide moving, right? Can you see the second slide with the pictures? Right. Can you confirm? So I guess it? it's actually uh, stuck now, I think. Uh, it's stuck. Okay, let me. Okay, let me try. Okay, now can you confirm if the second screen is visible? Sir, can you just stop sharing and reshare it again? Yeah, I'll try again, maybe. Yeah, and can you see the slide now? Yes, sir. It's visible. Now, oh, perfect. Now, does it change? I'm just moving the slides. Can you see the second slide? Uh, no, only the first slide is visible right now. It's not changing. Okay, maybe let me try sharing my entire screen because I'm say sharing the application. Yeah, now can you see my screen? Your screen is visible, but can you just, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's okay. It's perfect. Oh, okay. Okay. Right. Okay. It's yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Thanks for confirming. And, um, well, I can also put my video on if the bandwidth is good. I can also see. Yeah. So yeah, thanks for the introduction and I'm going to start my talk. So something I, I will tell about before I start this presentation is, uh, yeah, why I'm presenting this topic. So as uh, you have read my introduction is all about integrated circuit design so my areas of research has always been integrated circuit design uh, so uh, this is one of the course i used to give in eindhoven university technology and this this particular talk is about the introductory part of the lecture uh, so i try to keep it quite high level and and Biranjit also told me that uh, there are students from different backgrounds who are not familiar with uh, electrical electronic engineering uh, so uh, can you can you please just confirm if there are students from other uh, other departments in this in this talk so that I can keep my level of explanation to a very high level. I think there are uh, yeah many I think uh, yeah students from mechanical in fact the chair chair himself is from mechanical engineering. Uh, okay. And, yeah. Uh, I think, uh, 
Yeah, so I I, it's a, I, I made the pres made sure that the presentations are quite high level. So I, I'll try to keep it quite high level. And if you have any questions, I can try to explain it in a high level. So, OK, let's start and see how it goes. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, so maybe, yeah, so integrated circuit. So you, you all know what is an integrated circuit, is right? I mean, you can call it as a chip. Uh, there's a chip exists in every device around, surrounding you. It's there in your smartphone, it's in your laptop, it's even in your rock, uh, in, the, in the commercial rockets or in the aircrafts. And, and even in the modern cars, you can see hundreds of uh, electronic compute units, which are actually chips or integrated circuits these days there to, to control your uh, fuel injection system or uh, controlling your braking system in your car. So everything is, uh, is done uh, using integrated circuits. So it has formed a, a critical component in almost every device surrounding us. So why, before I go into the talk, just a very high level motivation, why we should worry about the power consumption in these devices. A, a simple uh, tongue in cheek answer is, so you know the total energy of a Milky Way galaxy is roughly 10 to the power 59 joules. I mean, this is a very conservative estimate. And uh, assume that the minimum switching energy for a digital gate. So digital gate is actually a fundamental element inside your chip. Uh, it, it's, it's a very small element and you might have even studied in your one of the courses. And assuming it is around 1.6 times 10 to the power minus 20 joules, which is quite small. Uh, and if you assume the total number of operations per year performed by 1 billion 100 millions of operations per second computers is 3 to the power uh, three times 10 to the power 24. So this assumption is because roughly assuming there are 1 billion devices of smartphones or computers across the world, which is also a reasonable estimate. Uh, and if you assume the computational requirements of these devices double every year, that means you need more and more features every year. Uh, the entire energy of the galaxy will be consumed in 180 years. So this is just a tongue in cheek answer. You don't need to take it for granted just to tell you the, the impact of uh, uh, the power energy consumption, no matter how small it is, it doesn't matter. Uh, in the end, uh, if, because, because there are so many devices across the world and so many computations performed by each and every gate, uh, millions or billions of gates in these devices, uh, it, it needs uh, so much of energy, basically. That is what uh, the main message about this, um, this slide. So coming to the, the real, more realistic story, uh, you know about uh, the different uh, uh, the, the mobile phones, right, across generations. I mean, some of you might not have seen the first generation mobile phones, uh, but it, it has started in the form of this shaped forms, which are very bulky, and then it has become thinner and then thinner and thinner. And of course, if you also see the more and more features integrated into these devices, Previously, the, the phones were only for making phone calls, and then you could do SMS texting, then you could do data con connectivity, watch videos, and then now 4K videos, and then you can also, in the future generation phones, you can also connect to IoT devices and so on with the 5G technology. So one thing uh, you need to note here in this picture is what has happened is miniaturization. So miniaturization means the devices become thinner and thinner. Of course, it became larger in, uh, in other dimensions, but uh, the, the, the thickness have reduced. And that's, um, I'll come to that, how it is uh, it was possible. And then uh, these devices, of course, provides a large feature list. That means compared to the first generation, and now you, you have plenty of features in your device. And also longer battery life, that means it, uh, it, it lasts longer. Of course, it's something it depends on uh, how much features you use. But uh, in terms of the amount of features, you have longer battery life. That means the battery capacity has increased a lot from this generation. And there is price erosion. So this is something like um, uh, previously, if you wanted to have a mobile phone with a connection, you had to pay a lot. But now even a common man can afford it. So that means the price also has reduced. And that means the, the whole device cost has been decreasing over years. And this is also very aggressive in wearable electronics. So you might have noticed this smartwatches and this kind of uh, smart goggles and other wearable electronics where miniaturization and, and these other features have aggressively um, uh, push the state of the art and enable devices such small in size and shape. Uh, and, and and that le led us to use a uh, lot of features that uh, was made possible 
using these devices. So the, the, the things that I list here on the right side are the major technology um, enablers to achieve this miniaturization and the large feature list and the longer battery life and price erosion. So one is transistor technology. So this is the fundamental thing uh, that uh, has evolved over years. That is something the main, uh, one of the main direction in which we will be discussing today. And the second is battery technology. The battery technology also advanced a lot that enabled to reduce uh, the miniaturization of the devices and also to provide longer uh, duration operation. And the third is low power design. So, uh, so these two, of course, help to miniaturize and also longer duration. But uh, the, 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 design, the design of this, uh, this transistor or the, the processors uh, to be able to operate with the low power consumption enabled it to prolong even the duration of the operation of the device. Uh, and also it, it also helped with the miniaturization that also we will see, see in a minute in the coming slides. And EDA tools, so this is electronic design automation. So for designing these chips, normally we use uh, design automation tools. So students from mechanical engineering also know that you use EDA tools for your designing of mechanical, but it's more or less similar. Uh, but there are a lot of significant advances in the EDA tooling in the, in the electronic design part, uh, which helped us to achieve uh, so high capable uh, uh, silicon devices uh, the, uh, in, in the current generation. So, uh, so before going to a bit more deeper dive, I mean, I, this is a very fundamental slide, I mean, to explain what is a CMOS transistor. So you might have seen this symbol somewhere or studied somewhere. So a transistor is represented by this symbol with the source, drain, and gate, and body. Basically, you apply potential across this uh, source and drain and control using the gate. And this is the fundamental device used in most of the digital integrated circuits and also in the processors. And uh, this is a logical uh, uh, representation and the physically it looks some device, something like this. And a three dimensional space is manufactured using the, some silicon materials. Um, uh, so phys physically it, it has to be more or less, I mean, in this format, I mean, the source and drain and gate. And there is something called oxide, which is red in color. So what it means by transistor scaling means the transistor has shrinked over years. Uh, is basically reducing or, or the size sizes of these parameters. So the thickness of this uh, the source, and as well as the thickness of the oxide, and the the LF, which is the effective length be between the source and the drain, which is one of the major parameters. So these parameters have been shrinking for a while over the last uh, 50 years. Uh, which has helped us to achieve this miniaturization. So this is not an easy task and it took 50 years to achieve uh, some shrinkage, which we'll see in the next slide. Uh, but uh, what ha happens is if we dimension the, uh, the reduce the dimensions roughly by 30 percentage um, uh, on this, uh, all these parameters, the, it actually doubles the transistor density. That means you can have twice the number of transistors in your chip basically. And then oxide thickness scaling, this is something the layer in between the gate and, and uh, the channel uh, helps uh, if, you, if, you, if you reduce the thickness of the oxide, it makes the transistor faster. That means higher performance. And that is why you have been able to see the clock speeds from your processors from, I don't know, from 100 megahertz to 500 megahertz to 1 gigahertz. And then now you see up to 4 gigahertz in your latest Intel processors. And power supply scaling and power supply scaling is something that helped to operate these transistors at a lower supply voltage and that has reduced the power consumption. So this is some fundamentals just to understand uh, the rest of the talk basically. So now I'm going to back on what how transistors have, have scaled over generations so this is this graph actually or this figure roughly shows 50 years of technology scaling starting from 1970 to 2020 uh, so on the y, y axis you see the transist the, the the nodes length actually this is you can see this as a length basically of the, between the source and the drain for simplicity but uh, it is actually the feature size of the transistor so you can see starting from around some somewhere just below 10 micrometer in 1970 it has reduced uh, up to now in 2019 5 nanometer and then we are going to become even three nanometers. So three nanometer, you can imagine how small it is starting from this. And this this took like 50 years of time. And this also needed several breakthrough and advancements in on device level to achieve this shrinkage. 
Uh, they started with the modern CMOS, the, the one that I presented in the previous slides, uh, the simple model. And then uh, they went on to submicron CMOS process and then introduced deep ultraviolet lithography. This is a fabrication process that uses light to control the fabrication process to achieve the high accuracy in the in the manufacturing. And they started introducing new materials around 2000 to, to enable fabricating uh, even smaller devices. And then they proposed new transistor st structure. If you might have heard about FinFETs, uh, they are unlike, they don't look like the one that I presented before. They have a totally different structure. Um, and then now the state of the art is five nanometer, which is currently, you can make a chip in five nanometer if you have enough money. <laughs> Uh, so the motivation for this is, of course, high integration density. We wanted to pack more and more transistors into a ch same chip, and we wanted to get higher speed, and we wanted to have better functionality. That means we need to integrate more and more functionality, and we also wanted to reduce the cost per bit, and that is why this industry has been going into this direction of shrinking the transistor size. So if you look at this graph, the other features you might have noticed noted might, uh, might might be this feature size shrinks by 70 percentage every generation so every generation you you don't see it in this graph clearly but roughly uh, is something like uh, 5 nanometer to 3 nanometer is one generation so b before 5 it was 7 and before 7 it was 10 so they don't switch um, uh, in, in continuous scale it is like in a more discrete scale and transistor so density level. Is the LF or... sorry this 5 nanometer is LF or is the total length? Uh, it is uh, the LF actually. So kind of uh, the, the, actually it is a feature size. Uh, so in the past, it is used to be the distance between the source and the on the, uh, the drain, which is the channel length. Uh, these days, the structure in FinFET, uh, the, the source and the drain surrounds the gate. Uh, so the, the 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 fine nanometer actually uh, it, it's hard to measure exactly as LF. It is more like the the overall dimension of the channel length. Okay, thanks. and you can see it like that. Yeah. Um, and and then uh, there are other things. What what happens with the shrinkage of size is wafer cost increases by twenty percent. So. Uh, if you reduce the size, of course, one of the problem is the wafer cost increases, but the chip cost will come down to 40 percentage. This is because you can produce uh, the, the chip in large quantity and try to bring down the cost of, on the chip level. Uh, and then um, uh, generations occur every uh, every 2.9 years over the past 34 years. Only in the last uh, 10 or 15 years, every two years we get a new generation. That means every two two years we get a new um, string version of the transistor. Of course, this is a very simplistic view I presented. Uh, uh, when, whenever a technology generation is uh, is proposed or, or by the materials or when the transistor structure is proposed. There's a lot of advancements needed in all aspects like uh, electronic design automation uh, and um, fabrication and production. There, there are several aspects needs to be taken care of before it can be made use to produce a realistic chip. So th this, this uh, trend, for instance, uh, of reducing the or, or number of transistors that uh, doubles with every generation has been observed by Gordon Moritz, uh, is a famous uh, engineer from Intel. He observed in 1965, he observed that the number of transistors on a chip doubled every year. But then he revised in 1975 uh, and mentioned that the doubling happens every two years. And since then, this trend has been following in, in the technology scaling, basically. So that's why th this Moore's law is, uh, is known for, which, uh, which you might have studied in the past. So if you look in, 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 in the shrinkage, what was the impact of this on, on a real processor? Uh, we can look at the Intel processors in this figure. I mean, um, you just look at this line, uh, the one below, not the one on the top that is on the memory. So here, what they show is the number of uh, devices per chip is roughly, you can say, transistors per chip uh, integrated into the same chip with every generation of the Intel processor. They, they have been integrating more and more transistors. Uh, so this was possible because of the technology sc scaling, which I presented in the before slide. Uh, so they could integrate with every Pentium. You see these names, you might, might be more familiar for you, Pentium generation of processors. 
uh, and then uh, they could also achieve faster speeds uh, with 2.5 gigs 3.5 6 gigs not there but this is more projection basically uh, so this, this proves that of course the transistor shrinkage helps to integrate more devices into the same chip um, and, and with a, we, we will be able to work with a reasonable power budget uh, so to understand the power consumption so that is the core of this talk I will also give a bit of background where is where is the power dissipation in the CMOS logic so uh, so this is this this is a basically simple a circuit of a uh, inverter basically you might have studied or i can also explain there's a two transistors connected uh, so uh, if you give an input pulse uh, from that is uh, going from uh, i mean high to low on the output you get a low to high that means it's that's why it's called an inverter and when actually you give a pulse like this at the input uh, there are uh, multiple ways the power is dissipated one is the active power basically that uh, that is coming from the vdd which is the power supply for the in inverter and that flows to the load capacitor which is output capacitor and that dissipates power and then there is a static part which flows uh, through this uh, two transistors because for a moment of time both of the, them will be on for a certain time and there's one more component uh, which is a leakage power assume that you are not operating the device uh, this this constantly uh, leaks some power that is unwanted power but because of the impurities and also the um, manufacturing yeah process variations you will have continuous leakage through the device so these three components will add up and dissipate as heat and that is why your processors get heated because this uh, even though if you're not operating your processors the leakage will simply burn energy so that is why shutting down a device is good to reduce the heat dissipation basically and also the power consumption but these two power consumption are normally components are normally during the operational mode and that is why during operational mode you are higher heat dissipation than during the standby mode so these of course are represented using equations which you don't need to worry about at the time being just to under make you understand what are the different components of power dissipation in, in a digital circuit and this is uh, this is shown for an inverter but it also happens with other digital circuits basically so what does it cause in the in the real chip i mean of course you might have seen uh, in the intel pro uh, in the processors it gets heated up you, you have a fan in your laptop and it starts running and it cools down to keep it uh, make operational uh, but you see how the power density have increased over years starting from older generation of intel processors 4004 to pentium uh, the power density initially did not increase much but uh, once uh, more and more transistors were integrated and more features were integrated into the transistor it started increasing so you could compare at some point you could compare with the hot plate of of your oven uh, it started to get hot as that or, or the power density to become as hot as the hot plate oven and then even now the generations the, the current generations um of, of uh, processors uh, get, gets heated as as a nuclear reactors temperature is quite high over 100 watts per centimeter square and and uh, it, it can it can also go up to 1000 watts per centimeter square in the mo most modern processors and of course if we continue this trend it will reach to the temperature of, of sun surface <laughs> which will be hard to control basically so at the moment there are a lot of um, cooling mechanisms uh, in in these devices to control the heat uh, for normal commercial processors like okay in your mobile phone is not needed because they keep the power but power dissipation to a limit uh, but in your laptop you need a fan for instance in a server you need uh, a more powerful fan or air conditioning or even water cooling in very high high uh, power supercomputers so that is why the 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 heat dissipation has to be minimized in the sense that the in, in other words the power dissipation is is very important this, this year and and if you look at the power trends for processors like this is the power per chip uh, for over last uh, two uh, yeah last 20 years yeah th this you don't worry about the individual points but just look at the trends the power per chip has been increasing four times uh, every three years uh, from 1980 to 1990 but then since 1990 you see it's only increasing 1.4 times three years because 
since 1990 onwards people have understood the importance of power uh, power dissipation in the chip or the power consumption in the chip because um, uh, because of heating and and then the difficulty with the cooling uh, and and also the limit of the battery life and and many factors like that and uh, also they reduced uh, they they were able to reduce this to this factor from 1990 because they were able to uh, till this point they were operating the transistors at the fixed voltage of 5 volts but beyond that they switched to lower supply voltages so now uh, the latest CMOS nodes you can operate to 0.9 volts or 0.8 or even 0.7 volts. Uh, so that is how uh, they um, achieved or the industry achieved a lower power consumption. And this is uh, st only telling the story till 2000, but even this this is the trend that continues even now, which I can confirm based our, on our recent findings. And of course, this is the normal trend for general purpose processes, the upper arrow, the bottom one is for DSPs which is like more like digital signal processors which are custom processors where which are actually used in your smartphones for instance the Qualcomm chipsets does the baseband processing uh, they, they are not allowed to consume or increase the power consume power per chip in this rate like in the commercial laptops or in the supercomputers because then uh, you don't have a cooling mechanism in your device and it can even burn your device that is why they make sure that uh, it goes down uh, the only way to go make it go down is uh, you need uh, smart uh, low power design techniques and you need to ready, uh, sub operate at lower supply voltage and also even the clock speed. So you might have noted the clock speed difference between your laptop and your smartphone. I mean, in your smartphone, you can clock maybe up to 1.5 gig or 2 gig, uh, but laptops can go up to 3.6 gig in, in turbo mode and, and, and so on. So the, that's why... Uh, the, the the performance difference is also there here between the two domains yeah so uh, this i've been talking about the power dissipation and importance and more than more is something which is the trend in which the current current direction in the industry is moving so i've been talking about transistors alone so in a system is not just a mobile phone or, or a um, um, wearable device is not just a transistor or, or digital design it has analog circuits it has passive components like dc dc converters and high voltage power supply uh, units and it also also has sensors and actuators because uh, you, you need a lot of sensors and actuators these days to interact with the physical world and it can also have biochips for instance in the future so all these de devices um, has to be integrated into the same chip or is being getting integrated into the same chip and that means uh, the, the more and more integration you can produce higher value systems and of course with the uh, miniaturization of the transis uh, transistors and combining this passive and other devices uh, will help to create higher value systems and also it will reduce the power consumption because uh, just assume that you have uh, a chip that is used for digital processing and one for the analog processing you need you will have two physical chips in your in your system and they have to communicate via an off chip uh, interconnect or bus and they consume also too much of power so integrating everything into the same chip uh, minimizes your power dissipation a lot so power so summary is the power is the dominant design constraint so without power power management any kind of competitive chip cannot be marketed in the entire application field and this is known to the entire industry i mean um, whenever we we design a chip for for industrial use case or application be it your qualcomm chipset or nvidia chipset the power management is treated as one of the crucial aspect because uh, without that they cannot uh, be competitive in the market uh, be it a high performance system like i mentioned it can be a graphics card for acceleration acceleration uh, where the heat removal becomes problem because uh, you have seen these fans uh, in the graphics cards which uh, which has to operate and of course if it gets heated beyond that uh, that limit then even the chip can be burned or the systems become slower the second issue is peak power power delivery because uh, you, one is heat dissipation and second is the power delivery in the sense that 
uh, it consumes way too much of power and there should be enough um, uh, delivery circuits, for instance, the DC-DC converters and the AC-DC converters, which are needed to supply the enough power supply for the, for the system that has to be there. And in the case of portable systems, the battery life, as I said, battery life is one important factor. So the more power dissipation, the battery life uh, uh, goes away faster. And there are also zero power systems. Uh, it is called zero power system, but it can be treated as extreme low power systems. Um, for instance, that, like the IoT nodes, which um, which uh, which senses some information from the environment and provides you um, some statistics. For instance, the temperature sensor or something like that. Uh, that normally can operate with a small battery, but also so there are systems which operates by energy scavenging by for instance using a solar small solar panel and stuff like that for uh, for processing the information and, and the most important aspect for power management is environmental effect i mean this is treated as a serious um, uh, aspect in a, a, every commercial product because uh, for instance I, I work in nokia and we build telecom systems and uh, there is a requirement to become co2 uh, low CO2 emission um, uh, needs from the authorities. So that means that the systems um, uh, should dissipate as low heat as possible. Uh, so that means the carbon footprint from these devices are quite less. There are stringent requirements these days uh, so that the impact on the environment is minimized. So let's look at a bit into details how battery storage was a limiting factor. So. Uh, one one reason why we should optimize for power in the in the when we make the chip is uh, you can also argue that you can put a big battery or you can put a large battery but battery technology did not evolve a lot i mean uh, basic the basic technology has still remained the same is to store energy using a chemical reaction and that is fundamental across all batteries and battery capacity increases between only 3 to 5 uh, 7% uh, and double during the 90s, but relatively flat before that. I'll show a graph in the next slide. Uh, and this is because, yeah, fundamentally there there has been no breakthrough in, in the battery technology to to integrate more and more, um, I don't know, capacity into into smaller area. And you can see as an example, uh, energy or density per size or safe handling are the limiting factor. That means you cannot pack more of these chemicals into a smaller area because of yeah, safety reasons and, and um, uh, similar reasons, for instance. Uh, so compare this just roughly shows the comparison of energy density of gasoline, which is um, 14 kilowatt hour per kg which is our gasoline or petrol. And then it's just to show comparison, this is not a battery, but a lead acid battery is uh, 0 0.04 and lithium polymer is uh, 1.5. So you can see uh, comparatively uh, to a petrol or, or gasoline is, is much, much lower. They can integrate into um, and, and, uh, as a battery in the, in the form of a battery. That means it cannot hold a lot of uh, energy uh, for, for a given capacity. And this is what I mentioned, like over the last, um, I don't know, 60, 70 years, this graph shows uh, the evolution of the different battery technologies, starting from nickel cadmium and sealed lead acid batteries, which are used in the previous automobiles and um, uh, nickel ma ma magnesium hydride. This is a different technology and then lithium ion. And then there was reusable alkaline and the modern is the lithium polymer, which is used in our mobile devices. So you can see, of course, the, 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 this has the highest uh, energy density, whatever per kilogram. That is why these, these are being used more in, in yeah, more compact or uh, devices or handheld devices. Uh, but uh, now, since now, just before like uh, that, uh, lithium polymer technology, the, the the energy density did not increase a lot, and that's why the the power consumption was was a major issue because the batteries would have died out very fast if you had to integrate a lo lot of features in your smartphone or, or in your tablet devices. Uh, it was almost impossible with this battery technology. So, uh, luckily, this helped a lot. But even now. Uh, these devices are not capable of running your processor uh, in battery operated, operated devices at high speeds like 3 gig or 4 gig because then your battery will um, finish uh, or empty quite fast. So still uh, the, the conclusion is that 
battery technology is is matured but not as matured as processor or, or chip or transistor technology or or to exploit the full potential of uh, transistor technology uh, so that is why uh, if we if we are able to run uh, transistor technology at higher speed or at, at higher performance uh, we have to make sure that it dissipates the lowest amount of power because uh, the battery technology is still not there uh, and then this uh, this figure again shows uh, the the limitation um, by uh, the, the the mobile functionality is limited by energy budget and this briefly shows uh, the same uh, the same one i mentioned before there can be watt nodes uh, for instance, these are like server or desktops, a computer, and this can be milliwatt nodes, which can be your uh, smartphone or tablet device, and microwatt nodes like the sensors. And, and this chart shows the power uh, demands for each of the device. For instance, the watt nodes are connected to the main supply, and the milliwatts uh, are battery, and you normally need days or at least weeks of runtime, but the microwatts or the sensor nodes. Uh, needs to be run fully autonomous or you don't want to change their battery quite often. I mean, if you have a temperature sensor somewhere, you want to change the battery maybe in several years or something like that. So that tells the story of the IoT. I mean, why the, the different nodes, for instance, uh, you have the physical world interacts with IoT nodes. I mean, the sensors and actuators and other devices. Uh, and that can be in trillions. And then you have kind of billions of uh, gateway concentrators through which you communicate with the internet and communicate with other users. And and the power budget of each of the device are different. So the, the, the servers can up, take up to thousands of watts. And the gateway connections of these uh, battery operated devices are in the order of tens of watts. And the IoT nodes are in micro watts. Uh, so this brings that uh, th this points that of course each each and every device in these segments can have different compute needs and also different power consumption needs and different battery life needs uh, and that they need to apply different power uh, power saving te techniques for instance uh, a server in, uh, running in the cloud is supply connected to the main power supply uh, they have expensive cooling using air conditioning and uh, they they are okay to run at higher speeds and worry not too much of power, but of course power is a problem there to to reduce the carbon footprint. So you should try to reduce the power as much possible. But when you design the a system or, or or a processor for let's say the IoT node, it should operate in the low power cons uh, uh, lowest power possible and also maybe harvesting energy from the from the surroundings or from the, using the solar panels. Uh, and then the techniques apply are totally different. I mean, the 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 way in which you design the circuit and the, the way in which you optimize for power has to be totally different. That means the power saving strategies are different. So talking about the IoT nodes, a bit more insights. So for instance, how much energy one can scavenge in one centimeter square. So uh, for instance, uh, if you want to have an IoT node that runs, uh, yeah, for instance, you can take a solar panel, which is in the outside, which has a high power density. So per centimeter square, it can produce uh, 15K mic or 15,000 microvolts. But if you want to scavenge energy using airflow, or, or maybe it's like a small turbine, then you get uh, 380 microvolt per centimeter square if you have a small fan of this size. And then human power, if you uh, apply some pressure, you can generate uh, using piezoelectric sensors or something like that, uh, 330. And with vibration, you can do like this, uh, 200 with temperature. So if you want to trans translate temperature to power, this and pressure is even less. And solar, a small solar panel inside your home can only give 10 microvolts per centimeter square. So just imagine a building a processor that can run with such smaller power consumption. So maybe if you want to have a small solar panel fixed to onto a temperature sensor, which has to process or, or measure the temperature and store it in a small database and communicate to your smartphone. Uh, then imagine you have to have a processor has to be operate uh, your processor has to work in this small power consuming budget so that makes it quite challenging to design and then of course this is a side note what can one do with one centimeter square? so since i'm talking with one centimeter square 
how much energy you can save let's see what human brain can do so uh, normally uh, this is not to compare with digital circuits but just to give you a perspective of uh, how powerful human brain is so uh, the average brain, brain power consumption is roughly 20 watts and this is out of 100 watts of the total human body power consumption because uh, 20 percentage um, of the total dissipation happens in the brain uh, and uh, assume uh, you just have to understand that only two percentage of the entire body weight is in the brain so that means the power density is roughly 15 milliwatt per centimeter square and out of this the nerve cells are only four percentage of the brain volume so it's a very tiny fraction of the entire the two two percentage um that uh, that can produce so efficient uh, or it has highest power de density and also it has a neuron density of 70 million centimeters square it's highly dense in the sense so this is not to compare a uh, human brain with digital circuits uh, but to tell the, the the capability of a human brain in in terms of computation for instance the neurons can do a complex nonlinear functions unlike a digital uh, gate or a uh, multiplier on adder so it is heavily compute power powerful and this i am presenting this mainly because uh, to motivate the rise of architectures like neuromorphic computing which you might have heard uh, so people have been thinking about um, coming up with novel ways to compute uh, something or even to compute some or to process some information uh, architectures called neuromorphic architecture which is heavily inspired by human brain just because of this fact that it has highest compute density uh, or that means how high it, the power density is quite high that means for the smallest amount of power you get the maximum benefit and, and that is the main reason uh, the, the research in those directions have been triggered uh, so that is about um, the, the something about uh, the directions in which the industry is going, but also uh, just to talk about how uh, uh, normally it works uh, with a with a uh, with a low power design process. I'll just give a bit of background, a very high level background. So you have the system which is uh, with a chip, and then you go into one more level down. You have the module level, and then you have the gate. Then you have the circuit, which I shown before. Then you have the device, which also I have shown before. But this ones I did not show. For instance, you can combine multiple of these transistors to produce a gate, and combine multiple of this gate produce a module, and then put together in a system. So that is the hierarchy in in the digital system design. Why I wanted to show this picture is um, in in the design process, and the impact on the power consumption. Uh, on a design decision uh, is higher in the system level and it and goes lower when you go to device level and then the but the complexity is higher on device level and and then uh, reduces on system level so the main message is like i mean when when you make a design de decision on on the or when we make a design decision on this uh, chip design or the processors for the future generations we should look from the holistic point of view from the system level system view uh, uh, un until now, most of the state-of-the-art solutions or power optimizations, they look on, on all levels. I mean, they try to optimize on device level, and then there are low-power techniques to reduce on circuit level, and then on gate level, and on module level. Uh, but And also exists on system level, but uh, there, there's very less work who looks on holistic point of view. That means modeling the entire system from a holistic point of view. Uh, for an application or a task when you run on the system, how, how, how quick you can make a decision on system level, which will give the highest impact basically. And that is something uh, which uh, the industry is now trying to do mostly, uh, unlike the traditional approaches. So the generalized low power design flow has a lot of steps. I'm, you don't need to worry, I'm not going to explain you everything. This, is a, this, is, this was the part of the course I taught. Uh, so uh, starting, as I said, starting from high level, you have system level specification, then you design architectural level design, then you do functional and logic design and circuit design and physical design, and then you send it to the fabrication to make the chip basically. And these are of course not outside our control. Once the chip goes to the fab, they make this part packaging and test, uh, testing, we can still do it. Uh, but uh, the low power design, when you want to design your chip, you, you want to make sure that of course, it consumes the lowest amount of power 
and all the steps that you mentioned, I'm not going to read everything uh, through it, but all the steps you need to, uh, to take care in every each of this, uh, sorry, all, all these steps you need or activities you need to perform in each of the steps here um, so that you get uh, an end-to-end -end optimized uh, uh, chip or, or power optimized chip and all the steps or activities that you need to do are different for different categories of chip. I mean, if you design a chip for server class application versus a mobile for IoT, um, uh, IoT node is totally different. So uh, that is why I said these activities are very specific to the application which in which you are targeting. So projecting into the future. So how it is projecting? How is the power is is going growing? So I, I showed that it, with the first initial graph, it is growing to the sun's temperature. But uh, realistically speaking, it is going in this direction. So the compute density is increasing to power of three. That means the more and more computations uh, you can integrate with uh, over the years have been increasing uh, to the power of three. Uh, so this is different from transistor integration density, which has been roughly doubling every two years. This is the amount of computations you can do. It's more like on the system level. Uh, and then there are two components, which I mentioned. One is the leakage power and active power. So in the active power actually also in includes uh, the other component, which I mentioned, the dynamic power. So they are also increasing to these factors, uh, 2 to the power 7 and 1 to uh, get to the power 1.9. So basically, uh, the message I want to say is that uh, although we apply uh, the transistor technology is scaling and the more and more transistors are being integrated and you can integrate more and more applications into the system. But uh, at the same time, we are also trying to reduce the power consumption by applying more uh, techniques by, by doing all these techniques. But even then the leakage power and the active power is increasing. Uh, so it is it is a fact and, and that is why it is an important aspect how to keep this in control. So with that, I would like to present maybe the conclusion slide. Of course, uh, technology innovations offer some relief. For instance, the technology scaling allows us to uh, reduce the supply voltage and reduce the power on high level. But the power density is increasing quadratically, as you have seen. So we need to embrace local to global power optimization. So that means from system level, we need to see what are the things that we could do. Unlike traditional uh, ways in which you uh, look at each and every steps here described individually, uh, you need to think look from a holistic point of view. Fundamentally, we need to think of architectures like, for instance, compute in memory architecture, which was uh, the idea is to combine memory and computation into the same uh, processor. And neuromorphic computing, which I explained because you know the enormous processing capacity of brain. So emulate that. So there are these are two of them i mentioned but there are numerous which you can think of and novel memory technologies because uh, as as human brain does we, we also have to store a huge amount of information or data and the memory is also consumes too much of power so there is also advanced advancements required and then advanced algorithms for electronic design automation tools so everything put together you need also tools because manually you cannot build uh, this if you have billions of transistors in your processor you cannot build your chip manually you need electronic design and automation tools and with all these uh, things together we could achieve a low power consumption yeah with that i would like to conclude my talk today uh, uh, any questions There is a chat, how power consumption of ICs are measured. Yeah, so <clears throat> normally, yeah, so maybe this, yeah, this is a step that is done here, packaging and testing. So uh, uh, normally the, the, for instance, like um, the, there are current measurement um, circuits which are integrated inside your chip. Um, so for instance, your chip, uh, I, I was very, explaining in a very simplistic way. Your chip need not be a single chip. It can have multiple blocks. Uh, that is what I was representing maybe with the initial figure. Uh, maybe let's go to that. Uh, yeah, this one. So in these days, we have a system on chip. Basically, you have different blocks. So for instance, 
you can have a processor, you can have a block for uh, communication, you can have an ADC and everything integrated. So ideally we would like to measure the power of each of the different blocks because then later once we make the chip, we can optimize the particular chip or the particular design. So uh, if you want to measure the whole chip, it is easy. You just plug into your test uh, bench setup and you measure the current consumed by the chip and then you multiply with the voltage, then you get the power. But if you want to do in individually, then you have to put current sensors um, for each of the blocks. That means uh, when you, when you design the block and, and then when you make the chip layout you make sure also in the design uh, the the power supply to the block uh, has a current sense in, in 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 the series for instance so and that just by measuring the the amount of current flowing through that block then we can compute the power consumption and that is typically we do uh, in 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 modern chips because as i said is a uh, chip is not a single chip it's a multiple system on chip uh, so that that is how it is done typically. Any other questions? Uh, if the participants have any questions to ask him, you can ask him now, or just can post it in the chat box, or you can un unmute yourself and ask him directly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. If if you don't have any questions now, you can always uh, send me a message or email. Uh, which, what uh, what is the like, one question? Manil, what is the typical energy consumption of our brain? Any you have any numbers? The the human brain. Human brain. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So th this number, for for instance, is like an. Uh, this is the power for instance the power is uh, is estimated to be 20 watts um, and and this is actually measured by a rough estimate for instance uh, the whole human body is assumed to or measured to be consuming 100 watts of power uh, and out of that uh, 20 watts is allocated to brain uh, because no, this yeah, is uh, from space means uh, you are sleeping or what it's uh, this, this is yeah this is not accurate i think the, it, it, assuming a normal uh, consumption of a human body because you cannot measure the power of a mm -hmm. uh, power consumption of human body i think this is uh, th this work is is like um, an approximate estimation based on how much energy you burn uh, your body and converting that to power so mm -hmm. this is just to uh, yeah, the, the idea is not, this is an, not an exact measurement just to illustrate uh, on average how much it consumes compared to an electronic device, but uh, we should never compare a human brain to an electronic device uh, in terms of power consumption because the capabilities and also the power measurements are never accurate. Mm -hmm. Sir, actually there is an interesting question which is often asked by youth. How does using an electronic device when charging affects its battery and why? How does using an electronic device while charging affects its battery? Yeah, this is... Uh, how does using an electronic device while charging affect its battery? And he might so, be actually uh, referring to uh, smartphones and all. There is a lot yeah, of... so it's yeah, it's 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 related to asking like why if 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 you are using your smartphone while it is being charged. Uh, so yeah, this this is something yeah, I'm I'm not an expert in battery design, but what I could under what I could understand is when you are using a device, uh, you are actually draining the battery and the, at the same time charging. So it has to do more with the chemical reactions inside the battery. So what I could assume, also you might have noticed that the device getting heated up quite a lot. So which is also not a good sign. I mean, normally when you charge and if you try to use, the battery gets heated because of the there are more active chemical reactions happening. So as I was saying, battery technology is simply a chemical reaction. I mean, in, inside happening. So the charging and discharging is, 
uh, totally different processors and if you try to combine both of them uh, it has to dissipate uh, some heat uh, which is which is not inefficient for the battery's life according to me um, yeah so uh, and, and some other things of course the the, the suggestions I, I would say is that um, the the more the the more heat dissipated from your device the chances are your battery will drain faster uh, the the reason is simply because the heat is dissipation is dissipated because or not because it is dissipated from the energy from the battery so no matter if you are using the phone for computation computation means like if you're watching a video or making a phone call the processor is continuously computing and it dissipates heat uh, and and even if you're not using sometimes it gets heated because there might be some background processes uh, doing computation inside the processor and that is why sometimes you might notice um, even when even with the phone phone in the standby mode getting heated up so whichever may be the case the, the dissipation uh, causes the battery to discharge faster yeah maybe i would like to ask so this uh, is this like uh, the 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 design is, is there anything that you guys are studying with respect to low power design in your curriculum or somebody from electronics background can answer that yes i'm not able to answer that <laughs> <laughs> yeah. maybe bidan can answer what's the what's the fine here there are some elective courses yeah for which uh, deals with this low power circuit design mm -hmm. but there are no compulsory courses related to that okay aspect. i see yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah and to be frank i don't think the, those electives are usually offered in our college yeah yeah also like uh, the, the process i mentioned the design for low power needs quite some tools uh, the the design automation tools uh, which 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 will also has to be part of the curriculum like uh, normally i've seen in masters level courses and of course this course is taught in a masters level um, course a masters level degree program uh, but yeah i just share the introductory lecture just to highlight the problems that needs to be tackled Okay, if anyone has any other questions or we'll actually wind up the session right now. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Manu, sir, can you uh, just stop sharing your screen for right now? Yeah, yeah. Hope I'm visible. Hope my screen is visible to you. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So, uh, so thank you so much, uh, Manil sir. On behalf of uh, IEEE Executive Committee GCBH, I wanted to express our sincere gratitude to you because uh, from Belgium, you actually are spending your valuable time with us because uh, we are also very much happy that you are part, you have been part of the uh, 15th anniversary celebrations and uh, the uh, official meeting will be held on uh, September 27th and we are so happy to have you here. It was a very insightful session and uh, I hope um, people from, <laughs> not actually, actually me, people from electronics and communications background might have found it really useful. Uh, mm -hmm. Even I got some useful information. Thank you so much, sir. And uh, yeah. I also thank our branch counselor, Bhutanjit, sir, for uh, joining us here. And he was the one who suggested you, and uh, you also instantly agreed to be part of this event. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. And, yeah, uh, I, I'm glad. I mean, I'm glad that I got opportunity. And I also gave a seminar in the past in your college, maybe not to your batch, but. Uh, Maybe. two years ago i think yeah. yes. yes okay uh, so i'm happy to share, share the knowledge because i'm also teaching in eindhoven university in netherlands so uh, if you have any questions or if somebody is interested to look into this direction like low power design or interested uh, please feel to send me an email and, and i'll be happy to uh, provide you more information
That's so and, uh, yeah. you, sir. Yes. Yeah. And uh, I would like to also thank all the participants who have been here. Thank you so much for participation. Thank you so much for joining us for this uh, 15th anniversary conclave. Hope you have a nice day. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.